Can we start? Yes. Uh, welcome to the fifth session of uh, LCAP. The LCAP webinar series were started by Asian Pacific Association for Study of the Liver to increase knowledge base, algorithmic approach, and improved patient outcomes across the world. LCAP program has a very strong advisory board uh, and also a very strong panel of experts. In the last four sessions, several topics, including resection, transplant, and surgery has been considered. Today, on behalf of our president, Professor Sheena, who could not join due to some emergency issue, I would like to welcome all of you across the world for this very important fifth session which is liver-directed loco-regional therapies for advanced HCC. We have an outstanding specialist, one of the respected, Professor Kanda, experts from Japan. Uh, thank you and welcome, Professor Kanda. Uh, we also have uh, a series of very good experts, Professor Bajal, Dr. Deepti Sharma and Professor Shalini Thapar. We have many experts across Asia who have joined. And I would also like to thank Dr. Ashok Chaudhary, who is the program coordinator for this to having organized. With this, I would pass on to Professor Kanda, the moderator for taking over and introducing the speakers for these sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sarin, for your kind introduction. Uh, <clears throat> this is Tatsu Kanda uh, from Japan. Uh, I will intro introduce today's speakers. First speaker is uh, Dr. Sajan Sarin. Bajar, Interventional Radiologist Chairman, Fellowship MD, MBBS, uh, uh, Gurugram, India, works at uh, Mendas uh, Mediti Garand, 35, uh, 35 years of ex experience. Uh, I will introduce um, introduction. Mm, of Dr. Uh, Bajar. Um, he is an eminent radiologist with experience of 35 years. His area of ex expertise covers vascular and interventional radiology and gastrointestinal radiology. He also offers treatment for pediatric cardiology. Uh, his special interest, radio diagnosis, vascular radiology, gastrointestinal radiology, interventional radiology, embolization, etc. And he also special interested in um, radiofrequency ablation. Uh, Professor Bajar. Let's talk, please. Uh, good evening. I must thank Apasil for giving me this chance to interact with this elite audience across the Asia Pacific region. It is a pleasure to talk to you and share some of my experience and thoughts on the management of advanced liver cancer, which is the topic assigned to me. Uh, may I scare, share my screen now? Yes, please, sir. Yes. Uh, 
uh, is it visible we can see the uh, your slide thank you so so the topic assigned today is what is the various trans arterial methods of treating patients and how to select if possible there is a optimized way to triage them in different treatment protocols and what would then be the outcomes if we were to do so so to briefly go back uh, these are my disclosures to go back to the new bclc which is not so new anymore uh, it has given us the now flexibility of placing patients in different uh, algorithms but allowing for stage migration and hence moving from one treatment to the next so therefore today we've got to discuss patients who are in advanced stage of uh, hcc be it because of portal veil invasion or extra hepatic spread or even patients who have had a deterioration in their performance status and have therefore been upgraded from an earlier stage basis tumor burden to an advanced stage because of the poor performance score so both of these would come into the advanced hcc group which is therefore summarized in this slide which tells us about the patients having a uh, Uh, some disability with regarding their performance status and of course portal vein invasion the portal vein invasion for uh, optimization of comparison of results is best done using either of these uh, methodologies of of labeling from vp1 which would be a segmental involvement to vp4 which would be the main portal vein and extending to the splenic and even the superior mesenteric veins we understand that systemic chemotherapy is a very exciting strategy now which has come to the fore and has replaced previous methods of systemic medication with the newer immunotherapy drugs moving to be far more effective than what was originally always talked of and was sorafenib and there are further lines of therapy that are also being considered and hence if you look at the bclc recommendation there is a fleeting mention of tear which is also known as sirt and it has been suggested that it could be as effective in liver only disease if you were to use that versus sorafenib and the reason for that is because they said until more positive trials are available the only one they can make recommendations on is the sara trial and here even though it was a failed trial we must understand and spend a minute as to why it was a failed trial and unfortunately there was too much heterogeneity the the structure of the trial was not so so optimized and hence if you do a subgroup analysis going backwards even though the overall survival was just 9 months if the y90 was done with adequate dose delivered to the tumor one sees that the significant longer survival can be attained of 14 months versus if it is less than 100 gray and you would land up with a dismal outcome of just 6 months it's also seen that if the planning of y90 was replicated on the therapy of y90 then certainly the outcomes would be far better as compared to if there were discordance which unfortunately was there in a large number of those patients another interesting algorithm that came out about 2 years ago from japan was how uh, to manage patients with portal vein tumor thrombus and in spite of the thrombus invading up to second order branches the push towards liver resection and going to salvage with transplantation was pushed to the fore and treatments of loco regional uh, nature using tes sbrt or tear were emphasized upon and hepatic artery chemo infusion as well all being pushed towards downsizing downstaging trying to get these patients to ablation and transplant which effectively is now what the mindset of most of us 
uh, as we go deeper into management of advanced liver cancer. This 2021 publication that came from Japan talked in great detail about the three most standard forms of treatment that are used in local regional therapy. The first one they talked about was the hepatic artery infusion chemotherapy with the evidence level of 1B and a recommendation of B for patients who had PVTT extending from type 1 to type 4, but with preserved liver functions. They said HAIC using uh, oxaliplatin or 5-FU would be the most appropriate treatment uh, if HAIC were to be used. As far as taste, again, with patients with preserved liver function, child's PUA, if the tumor was invading the portal vein tumor thrombus up to the segmental and up to the sectoral levels, uh, with a high level of recommendation and evidence, one could suggest stays. Because of the presence of some RCTs in which combinations of taste with radiotherapy were used as compared to taste alone, there is a recommendation that combination would definitely help. And similarly, molecular targeted therapies along with taste seem to be better than taste alone. There was a negative recommendation or a suggestion with a slightly lower level of evidence and support in which it was said that patients with a more compromised liver function or a more advanced portal vein tumor thrombus, type 3 or type 4, are best not treated with this. With Y90, again, it was 2B level of evidence with a recommendation of C that patients with child's PUA and portal vein tumor thrombus up to type 3 could be patients who would benefit if SIRT or TEAR were to be used. And hence, we look at this uh, inarsal modified BCLC staging system, which is, I think, just about to be published, in which the advanced stage was therefore broken up into two subgroups in which there are patients who have extra hepatic disease who go straight to systemic therapy, but in patients who still have liver centered and just locally advanced disease in the form of PVTT, one should be more aggressive locally and try to achieve tumor control slash downstaging for further treatments. And I'll come to that a little while in a little while. If we look at a study which compared safety of sorafenib uh, versus HAIC in patients with advanced HCC, it was very interesting to see that the median overall survival and the TTP were significantly longer if we were to use targeted therapies because the disease logically is still contained within the liver, even though it is locally advanced in the PVTT, as compared to if one were to go to sorafenib alone with a 14.9 month versus a 7.2 months in the overall survival. Uh, and, and therefore, the objective response were also therefore more in the local regional therapies. If we look at this RCT that compared sorafenib uh, plus low dose cisplatin 5-FU HAIC versus sorafenib alone, coming from this study from Dr. Kudo and Dr. Arai, of RCT which said that if you were to use HAIC along with sorafenib, patients would do better other than using sorafenib alone. But interestingly, when they, group, when they broke up uh, the, the groups, there was no significant difference if this combination was used in patients who had no vascular invasion or even vascular invasion up to VP1 and 2, 3. However, it was in VP4. That means the most advanced local uh, HCC patients where the benefit was coming through. And it is in those patients that we would definitely have an extra overall survival rather than if sorafenib was used alone. And similar, therefore, if we look at a more detailed chart which shows how the outcomes of VP3, VP4, we look at the distinct differences in the outcomes. 
Similarly, if we look at VP3, VP4, again, significant months of difference. And in the study of Dr. Kudo, which I just mentioned, a distinct difference. And similarly, again, VP4 showing a 9.7 versus a 5.5 month difference. And therefore, the overall survival trying to say is the, the advantage is the best if the disease is also the most advanced. And therefore, could we make a summary? I think the closest that one could summarize is that HAIC with sorafenib has a role in VP4 and it has shown to be of advantage over sorafenib alone in this advanced stage of NCC. When we look at trans-arterial chemoembolization, and again, combination therapies of taste with radiotherapy versus chemoembolization alone. Again, in this locally advanced stage of uh, HCC, it has been found that interestingly, the blending of RT with taste has resulted in patients requiring lesser number of taste sessions, which was a very interesting outcome of this analysis that was done of a large group of studies. And they also found that there was significantly better one-year, two-year, and three-year survival rates for patients in whom taste with RD was done versus taste alone. And this happened to be seen in patients who had PVTT or without PVTT as well. Though today's topic is ones with PVTT, there, therefore, this meta-analysis concluded that combination with RT makes a definite impact. An RCT, which again evaluated the role of taste with external beam versus sorafenib alone, and an outcome at 12 weeks showed that it was distinctly superior if taste and RT were used as far as progression-free survival was analyzed. A further analysis of these patients at 24 weeks also, it showed a much better radiological response if taste and RT were used as compared to sorafenib. There was a superior 31 weeks versus 11 weeks advantage as far as time to tumor progression was seen. And it also reflected in an overall survival advantage if TACE and RT were used as compared to sulafenib alone of 55 versus 43. Though we do understand at this point that the standards have changed and I must admit that it's now sulafenib has to now move, give way to uh, immunotherapy, and that's what actually the proof of the pudding would be if data comes in there. If we look at a propensity score match analysis of chemoembolization plus RT versus chemoembolization plus sorafenib, again, there was not too much of a difference. Trying to say that something is added on to taste, and that's what really improves the outcomes, and whatever you add to taste would definitely be of benefit. So can we summarize again here? We can say that there is a role of combined therapy of taste with RT or with sorafenib in patients with PVTT. And either of these would improve progression, time to progression, and would also impact on overall survival. We must therefore also understand that combination holds the key because compared to taste alone, I think combination therapies would give better results. Which brings us to the analysis of data of Y90. And, and I think that the legacy study is the study which has brought in the role of Y90 uh, in the BCLC classification. And interestingly, 40% of patients in the legacy study group were those patients with advanced HCC. However, they were all there because they had a poor performance status because one of the inclusion criteria up front was absence of portal vein invasion. So trying to say that the other cause of patients getting into the advanced stage, that is a poor performance status, does not take them away from local regional therapies. And therefore, in that patients, the legacy study, which showed that if you were to treat using an appropriate dose of radiation to these patients in the advanced group, one would get 
a good outcome. And this, these were the inclusion criteria, which, like I said, that there was no portal vein thrombosis and they all had preserved child score. They looked at local tumor control and they looked at duration of response. The duration of response was labeled as response after the documentation of the first response. And here in the patients with the advanced HCC, there was at three years a survival of 93%. Though I must again reiterate that these are advanced HCC because of a poor performance status and not because of the local portal vein tumor invasion. Here is another group which compared an RCT of patients who were undergoing Y90 versus DC beads. And here again, the patients who were in the compromised ECOG performance state were the reasons why they were being labeled as advanced HCC. And here the results were so overwhelmingly more superior in the Y90 study as compared to the DEB arm that the study was terminated because the uh, time to tumor progression was 17 months compared to nine months and the overall survival was also nearly double in the Y90 group. If we look at patients who had BCLCC and BCLCD in this uh, analysis, uh, of 17 studies in which there was one RCT, four prospective studies and 12 uh, retrospective studies. They had patients who had portal vein tumor thrombus. They found that there was no significant overall survival difference if you were to use tear or you were to use taste, but the time to tumor progression was significantly superior, nearly double that if Y90 were used 17.5 months as compared to 9.8 months if TACE was used. Definitely, therefore, saying that you would require multiple sessions of TACE to achieve the same results. The, the reason why I bring in the dosisphere study is that this actually emphasized the appropriate use of radiation in Y90. Y90 has to be done the right way in the right group of patients to give them the best, best benefit. So in this group of patients who had PVTT, the, F, the effort was to try to decide what is the best dose and how does dose really impact on outcomes. So once the patients were found eligible for Y90, they were then broken up into two groups, the standardized dosimetry, which gave 120 gray, or the personalized dosimetry, where the effort was to give at least more than 200 gray, trying to go to 250 to 300 gray to the liver, tumor, and preserving liver function. There were large tumors, because one can see that they were up to 10 centimeters, and a number of patients, nearly two-thirds to three-quarters, in both groups had portal vein tumor thrombus. So this is more exactly what is our discussion today. And very interestingly, it showed that the personalized dosimetry group, that means the group in which we were giving higher dosage as compared to the standard dosimetry, the results were 26 months of overall survival compared to less than a year if it were given in the standard way that tear is done. If the dose was analyzed, tumors who received more than 205 gray of radiation, those patients had a dramatically superior overall survival of more than 26 months compared to those patients who received a lesser tumor dose, where then the outcomes were dismal with only seven months of survival. Therefore, dose is the key. And if we look at these patients, how many patients got downstaged in the personalized dosimetry? Nearly a third, whereas we had only 4% who got downstaged in the standard way of doing tear. And in the patients who had portal vein tumor thrombus, nearly half of them got downstaged if we were able to give them high dose, whereas no patient in the standardized dose. Again, overemphasizing that the dose has to be right. And we have to give high dose to achieve the best results. And a similar result was 
obtained when the raisin spheres were used and therefore maturation of a term called ablative tear. So high dose radiation in an ablative tear format is actually what is going to give us the best result. Whether you use glass or raisin, patients who had PBTT up to main portal vein or right or left branches, the results would be superior if we got them to high dose. And if we look at the survival, it was 45 months compared to 18 months. Much better if we gave them higher dose of ablative SIRT versus just standard forms of SIRT. The Korean study has also very recently come out with their experience in which they said that the overall survival of tear as compared to TKIs was significantly better of 28.2 months as compared to just seven months in the TKIs with a much lower risk of death. They also said that the progression-free survival, even though similar, show uh, in the two groups, the tear group showed definitely better progression-free survival, especially in the VP1 or VP2 uh, patients. There was also definitely a much lesser adverse events and, and therefore it was much more easily accepted. A single center study in which tear and taste were compared, even though there were a more, more angry and more biologically aggressive uh, tumors in the radioembolization group as compared to the taste group, there were more locally advanced patients in the radioembolization group as compared to the taste group. These patients were evaluated for drug eluting beat taste versus SIRT. And in spite of patients having much more advanced disease in the CERT group, the progression-free and overall survival were much better in the CERT groups, 564 versus 271. Uh, CERT versus DEB and 1198 days in the uh, CERT group as compared to the CERT groups, uh, as compared to the DEB group as far as overall survival. So, in both ways, TTP or overall survival, CERT tends to score over DEB. And similar is our experience and we wanted to actually build a strategy where we were aggressively trying to downstage patients to curative intent. In our experience that we published two years ago, we had a protocol of giving SIRT. We also added SBRT to the portal vein tumor thrombus. So we tried to give portal vein tumor thrombus the reason for upstaging of these patients, a double hit, trying to pull them down to a downstaging strategy to enable them to undergo transplant. So if these patients were downstaged and then they went to transplant, we had half the patients surviving at five years. Trying to say that the overall survival definitely in patients who were downstaged were better than and if you were to put them to transplant without downstaging, which happened in a small group of patients nearly 10 years ago, the most interesting data was that patients who were downstaged, patients with PVTT who were downstaged and then transplanted, if that group was compared to patients who had no PVTT and received LDLD upfront, the results were tending to come together, trying to say that if downstaging can be done effectively, the downstaging could convert patient behavior to as if they had no PVTT. So we felt that if we could get them downstaged, though the down conversion rate was not so good, but of those who reached the door to transplant, the outcomes there were at least half the patients there at five years. So where can we really summarize is the use of SIRT? I would say it is definitely a strongly 
an accepted form of local regional therapy in BCLCC. It has to be done in an ablative format with optimized planning and dosimetry because that holds the key to the best outcomes. Institutional experience as is built up in many centers and now we are not the only ones. We have reports coming from other hospitals as well where they have used similar strategies of SIRT and SBRT to the PBTT. It has proven to be beneficial as a downstaging these patients to transplantability, even though they were labeled as advanced HCC. Just to just run a case and example, this was a 45-year-old male, HPV-related CLD with a relatively preserved child score, infiltrative disease, and there was a VP4 uh, stage of the portal vein tumor invasion. It was FDG avid, though the alpha fetoproteins were within limits. One can see that there was a, a portal vein uh, tumor thrombus, which, which can be uh, very obviously uh, seen invading the main portal vein here. The patient was taken for Y90 therapy, angiographies were done, selective arteries were cannulated, and we gave 200 gray to the tumor with a lung shunt fraction of 9.5 and hence being uh, lung safe. SBRT was given to the portal vein tumor thrombus using cyber knife after placement of fiducials. One can see the fiducials shining here. And both of these were given. There was a tumor response. The, the, the portal vein tumor thrombus was totally bland on the follow-up imaging. The tumor in the liver was not enhancing anymore and it was regressing. This patient was transplanted. And seven years after transplant, the patient is still doing well. He recently came to us with follow-up and, and the patient is disease-free. So I'm not saying that it's a success story every time, but we aspire to try and achieve this. And I think the, the thrust for future studies of combination therapies probably holds the key. And if more results come out. We are waiting for exciting results of the trials of immunotherapy with SIRT versus SIRT alone for these advanced stages of uh, HCC to pull them back into potential curative treatments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Vajar. Uh, thank you. Nice talk about uh, uh, various uh, arterial embolization approach and uh, mm, patient selection and outcome in advanced HCC. Uh, is there any question from audience? No. And uh, uh, you stressed uh, uh, mm, those, those is key. I agree no. with you. Yes. And uh, uh, in the India, uh, how's the etiology of HCC and liver disease? Uh, hepatitis B is main cause, or alcohol is called main cause. In in our patient group, yes, yes. Uh, it, it was a mixed etiology. Mm, okay. No, no selective still towards any one etiology. Mm, okay, thank you. And uh, we have uh, no experience uh, uh, of uh, Y90. Uh, do you use them for treatment at CC? Yes. So mm. the result that we shared was using SIR spheres, the raisin spheres, for our SIRT hmm. along with SBRT to the portal vein tumor thrombus. And then if downstage successfully with a waiting period of three to six months, they would go to transplant. Hmm. So we okay. did use SIRT. Hmm. Uh, yeah, Dr. Baisal, just one of my points. So if you are having bile disease, so what will be your plan? 
so we we look at the underlying liver function if if the liver function is preserved and if we can do pyloba treatment with a lung safe dose and we can achieve if using glass spheres 400 gray to the tumor or if using resin spheres more than 205 gray to the tumor we would go ahead with pyloba treatment mm. with ensuring that the liver receives less than 40 gray mm -hmm. so the yeah. dosimetry holds the key uh, and we have a different dose limits if for one time therapy versus a cumulative therapy so if there is a dose limiting issue we would break it up into biloba treatment but if we can fulfill the criteria of liver safe lung safe and tumor kill dosimetry we would go to a biloba treatment mm -hmm. yeah so how to assess the response is the same ct scan or how to assess once you have given the pair so how you evaluate the response right so so we do a pet on the next day uh, hmm. or within 24 hours it, it it's a plain pet to document that the therapy has sat the way we had planned it and then the response evaluation happens with usually an mri at 2 months then 3 months and then 6 months we know that there is a delayed response on imaging uh when y90 is used and hence an early evaluation is sometimes misleading and we have moved therefore as the first imaging at not before 8 weeks mm -hmm. thank you uh, so kanda please i think uh, oh uh, professor bajar i think uh, uh, a little bit difficult to evaluation Uh, of the effect of the radiation therapy uh, um, other than portal vein thrombus uh, how did you uh, do the evaluate the response so so we looked at the response using mr and we had three criteria that we had if it was pet avid on the pet ct we would have to use pet ct to show that it is non avid mm. if there was an arterial enhancement on ct or mr we had to show that it is non enhancing on the same modality and if there were any ancillary findings of diffusion restriction which were seen we had to show that they were not present on the follow up so all the criteria had to be fulfilled to document this patient as a responder mm. then only would that patient move towards a possible transplant thank you and uh, we have a uh, several question from audience one question is what ab how about uh, combine the radiation therapy with systemic therapy in advanced hcc so i think that is exactly what uh, i i summarized and i think that's what holds the key mm. systemic therapy and now with the exciting immunotherapies showing such great results probably the ideal combination has to come and mm. and we also firmly believe that along with loco regional therapy it will have to be a combination with systemic therapy that would give us the best results so i don't have a clear cut recommendation just now thank you another question is do you wait till full response before liver transplantation yes so i think we just discussed that point when you asked me to how we evaluate portal vein tumor thrombus so that is the same answer that we have to ensure that all the criteria which tell us that there is a viable pvtt have to be shown to have responded fully so again to repeat pet avidity becomes pet non avid 
enhancement becomes non-enhancing and any diffusion restriction on MR has to show loss of diffusion. Uh, thank you, Professor Bajar. Thank you for nice talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And I must thank Dr. Serene as well, uh, mm -hmm. especially. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we move to uh, next speaker. Uh, next speaker is uh, Deepti Sharma, mm. MD Associate with Pre Professor Radiation Oncology, ILBS, New Delhi, India. Uh, <clears throat> her exp expertise area, stereo radio, stereotactic radio surgery, SRS and stereotactic radio therapy, SRT for brain tumor uh, and stereotactic body radiotherapy, SBRT for primary liver cancer, HCC, cholangiocarcinoma, and for metastasis to liver, lung, and bone. And uh, mm, miscellaneous. And uh, uh, She also uh, is an expert for cancer prevention, especially, especially for SCC, GI malignancy, breast, and cervical cancer, and hot dynamic therapy. Uh, Dr. Sharma, please. Yes. Good evening, sir. So, yes. Uh, can you hear my screen? Yes, please. I can see. I can see where. Let's yeah. start, please. So, uh, good evening. Uh... At the outset, outset, I like to thank the team APASA for giving me the opportunity to present my data, my experience in HCC. So most of my work has been done, uh, made easy by uh, Professor Bajal uh, in his previous uh, lecture. So the today's topic uh, is radiation therapy in HCC management with or without tumor thrombosis. As we all know, as per the BCLC classification, advanced stage BCLC uh, consists of the patient with tumor thrombosis in the form of either portal vein tumor thrombosis or inferior vena cava tumor thrombosis with or without lymph node metastasis or distance metastasis with a performance score of one to two. Such patients are usually treated with systemic therapy with a mean overall survival at, uh, with the overall survival at one year to the tune of 30 to 60%. So as per the guidelines, systemic therapy is the treatment of choice. So starting from the sharp trial to embrave trial, the overall survival is 30 to 60%. But in this group of patients, usually good liver function test patients were uh, recruited. But the local response rate, that is overall response, uh, complete response with partial response is to the tune of 30 to 40%. So. Uh, in this heterogeneous group of uh, HCC with PBTT, with metastasis and low local control, there's a need of some effective local regional therapy so that we can increase the local control, which in turn translate into increase in overall survival as well. So the rationale for the local regional therapy is it reduces the burden of disease, increase local control, improve local symptoms, and has an additive effect with TKIs and immunotherapy. As per the MU et al. in the recent publication in 23, uh, the authors has concluded that increase in local control and early local control has resulted in increase in overall survival, even in the cases of advanced HCCs. So SBRT or stereotactic body radiation therapy is a form of radiation in which highly conformal radiation therapy to the dose of 30 to 50 gray in three to five fraction is being delivered under image guidance to achieve a tumorocidal doses at expense of minimum normal tissue irradiation 
the aim is to increase the tumor control probability, but at the same time so reduces the dose to the organ at rest and in turn leading to normal decrease in normal tissue complication probability. Now the predictors of outcomes post SVRT. So it's mainly the liver function test, tumor burden, performance status, and the sarcopenia. There are different staging has been used like CTP, LV, LBT, TNM, and Hong Kong staging system, which incorporates either of the uh, factors like liver function test or the tumor burden. Here are the studies where LB has been compared with child quick scoring, and it is, both the studies have showed that a baseline LB score was more discriminating than the childhood score in predicting the overall survival and toxicity in patients undergoing SVRP. Further, the LV consists of mainly albumin and bilirubin, that is the liver function test. If we incorporate the TNM staging as well, so the LVT staging, in this publication from our institution, we have showed that the patient, when subclassified on the basis of LVT score, so the patients with LVT score of two, had a better overall survival of 100% at one year as compared to LB score, LBT score of five with a zero uh, survival rate at one year. So this shows that uh, the LBT is a better predictor for the survival and to select the optimum treatment strategy. For the sarcopenia is one is another factor which may uh, help to find out the overall survival in long term. So in this, again, uh, abstract publication from our institution and another study, uh, study by Yang et al. Both studies have showed that the baseline sarcopenia is associated with poor survival. Whereas the UN et al. has also showed that a loss of 7% in muscle mass post radiation therapy is a predictive factor for poor overall survival. So we have to see for the performance status as well as the general buildup of the patient as well. So keeping all this in mind, the so sum of the select criteria for selection, the patient for SBRT is the patient who is not suitable for a surgery or RFA with an intact liver function of child's A to B7, LB grade 1 and 2, more than 40% of the liver uninvolved by the cancer, tumor more than 0.5 centimeter from the organ at rest, like uh, duodenum, bowel, and oligometastatic disease is also considered as the selective criteria. Whereas the contraindication to liver SBRT is impaired liver function test with child C, LB grade 3, liver enzyme more than six times of upper limit normal, less than 700 cc of the non tumor liver, and infiltration of the serial organ. Now, the role of radiation in advanced HCC can be dealt under following headings that is, HCC with PVTT, early BP1 or 2, extensive portal vein tumor thrombosis or IVC tumor thrombosis large infiltrating HCC as a sequential therapy to local regional therapy or systemic therapy like TKI and immunotherapy and SBRT for the oligometastatic disease. Some uncommon scenarios are ruptured HCC and post LDIT recurrence. So I'm not going in the details as already been discussed uh, earlier. So uh, HCC with portal vein tumor thrombosis, BP1 and BP2, so in this, the radiation therapy can be used as a downstream procedure, either as a single modality or as a sequential therapy with TACE or TAIR, especially for BP1 and 2. So in this trial, which is published in JCO 2019, here the adjuvant radiation therapy has been used as a new adjuvant procedure. And post-radiation therapy, there was a partial response of 20% and stable disease in 70% of the patient. And we can easily see that the overall survival and disease-free survival was more in the patient who received new adjuvant radiation therapy as compared to upfront surgery. Uh, similarly, this is another paper where uh, sequential therapy with tear has been used. And this paper is already discussed uh, by Professor Bejel. And again, there are 63% of the patient were downstage post -radiation, uh, radiation therapy and tear procedure. And further, in 25 patient LTLT was done. So the five-year overall survival in the downstage group of patients, as well as five-year disease-free survival in the uh, downstage patients were better in as compared to the non-downstage non group. 
Now the role of radiation therapy in extensive portal vein tumor thrombosis. Extensive portal vein tumor thrombosis usually refer to the VP3 and VP4 or the inferior vena cava tumor thrombosis. So these are some of the studies where the radiation therapy has been used in extensive PVTT and IBC tumor thrombosis. Again, with radiation therapy, we could achieve a complete, uh, complete response and partial response that is overall res response rate up to the tune of 70 to 80% and progressive disease was there in about 15 to 10 to 15% of the patients with an overall survival uh, ranging from 30 to 40%. This is one of the study which has been published from our uh, institution, the role of palliative SBRT in BCLCC FCC patients. So in this radiation therapy was used as a palliative uh, treatment uh, in 35 patients with B, mainly VP4, 75% of the patient. Lymph node metastasis was there in 60%, distant metastasis in 50%, with an echo performance of one or two in 83%, LV grade two or three in 86% of the patient. So the patient was not fit for any other mode of local regional therapy and was considered for radiation therapy. So post-treatment, there was improvement in the quality of life. We can say this because there was improvement in the pain, abdominal discomfort, loss of appetite and weakness in about 80 to 85% of the patients. Here are the Kaplan near curve for the overall survival with the mean overall survival of nine months and local control was 80% and one year. A few cases. So in this case one, we have a large tumor, elderly male, 10 centimeter tumor in segment six and seven with VP4 tumor thrombosis. can be easily seen on this MRI picture. And we have given a radiation dose of 40 gray in six fraction to the tumor as well as the PVTT. Patient has got a very high PIPCA of 66,000. Further, there was a complete response in the follow up at one year, two years, and at, even after three years, patient is doing well. Although the patient was kept on sorafenib tablet post radiation therapy. Second case infiltrating HCC, large tumor in segment five, seven, eight, and five with tumor thrombosis, VP4 extending up to the confluence of the splenic vein. And further, the patient has received radiation therapy to preserve the remaining liver of the patient. We have to give a very high dose to the core of the tumor that is about 40 gray, whereas the periphery of the tumor has received about 35 gray in 5 fraction and the portal vein has received 30 gray in 5 fraction. Further, after a year, the patient is doing well and clinically there was no disease. Phase 3, large tumor, left lobe with the portal vein tumor thrombosis VP4 and uh, there was contralateral portal vein involvement as well. He is an elderly male of 75 years with VP4. So we have treated the vein tumor and the portal vein tumor thrombosis as well. And even after two years, patient is doing well. The point is that the patient has not on, in, is not on either of the adjuvant therapy. Now, is there any role of uh, P SBRT in inferior vena cava tumor thrombosis. So this is another paper which is published from our institution where the radiation SBRT is being used for IBC tumor thrombosis and uh, eight patients out of 17 had the tumor thrombosis up to the right atrium. So the radiation was given up to that extent. And after, during the follow-up, we have a median overall survival of nine months Median local control is not reached. At one year, it was 80% and median progression free survival of eight months. For a large infiltrating inoperable HCC who are not fit for other modalities as well. Again, we have treated with, um, there are further many studies uh, from all over the world. One of the studies is from Tata Hospital in India. So they have also found that the dose of 40 to 50 gray in five to six fractions is uh, can be easily given with a objective response rate of about 75 to 80 percent and progressive disease in 10 percent. And again, in this group also uh, with VP1 tumor thrombosis, further the patient has received radiation therapy up to 35 gray, 37.5 gray to the core of the tumor and 30 gray to the periphery. And here is the volumes 
on the anterior posterior and on the coronal and the transverse plane. And then the patient was uh, followed up with uh, immunotherapy in uh, nubulumab based immunotherapy and there is complete response at one year. For the radiation therapy can be used as a sequential therapy with local regional therapies. So these are the meta-analysis where taste with radiation therapy was compared with taste alone and in another meta-analysis SBRT was compared with SBRT plus taste. So in both the meta-analysis they have suggested that improve, there was increase in overall survival and local control after a combination of therapies. So as we all know, as per the guidelines, BCLCC, the treatment is systemic therapy. So in this trial, they have tried the local regional therapy, that is TASE versus SBRT, TASE plus SBRT versus Soraferet in BCLCC group of patients. So what they have found, they concluded that the local regional therapy, even in BCLCC, is far better than systemic therapy. And there's an improvement in the median PFS, time to progression, and overall survival. So uh, this is for sure that combination radiation therapy with taste is a treatment uh, which is usually done in all the patient and is of the choice. So what should be the sequence of radiation with taste in this uh, randomized control trial? which is published in Hepatology International last year only. They have tried radiation therapy followed by TACE versus TACE followed by radiation therapy. And in this trial, they have found that the median overall survival and the median progression free survival was better in the group who has received radiation therapy first followed by TACE. Uh, this is another case that we have treated a uh, large HCC segment 5-8 segment four. So he has received uh, three sessions of taste. After uh, three sessions of taste, there was decrease in the arterial enhancement and size of the region as well. Further, he, uh, he received radiation therapy to the lesion. And this is a follow-up scan of at six months and at one and a half month a year. So it is suggesting of complete response. Although the, because of the necrotic cavity, the size is reducing with time. But uh, the patient is in complete response. Now, SBRT with TKI, as per the new, as per the RTOG triple one two trial paper from Laura Dawson et al. in the publishing JCO twenty three. So again, in this study, they have showed that the combination of radiation therapy with sorafenib or any TKI, if it is of uh, reference, and it should be uh, used in the patients and it resulted in an improved in median overall survival and median progression free survival. So as we all know that instead of sorafenib, now lenvitinib is being used because of the newer trials. So in this propensity score matching analysis, SBRT was compared with SBRT and lenvitinib. And again, this trial has shown by, by the Yang et al that there is an improvement in the overall survival to the tune of 69% as compared to 49%. In one year progression free survival, 34% versus 9%. So the combination with, of SBRT with TKI has a role. So uh, in this trial, they have used all the three, that is TACE, SBRT, and Sorafen. And it's the randomized trial, and they have compared the TACE with radiation with Sorafen versus Sorafen alone. And it has showed that the triplet therapy has a better median overall survival and the median overall survival is increased by three times in this group of patients. Although there was no difference in the median PFS, but the PFS at one year is slightly better in the triple arm. Now, SBRT with immunotherapy, uh, usually there are two types of tumors, the cold tumors and the hot tumors. Hot tumors are the tumor where the tumor infiltrating lymphocyte is more than 60% as compared to a cold tumor where the stomal tills are less than 10%. So with radiation therapy, we can convert the cold tumors and the hot tumors by increasing the recruitment of the T cells. So with radiation therapy, uh, there is uh, more of the antigen release, immunological cell death, 
resulting in radiation induced antigen presenting cell maturation and antigen presentation to the dendritic cell which then leads to increase uh, in the T cell and there is a T cell recruitment and infiltration of the tumor in the tumor infiltration of the T cell in the tumor but due to the immunomodulatory effect there is sometimes increase in the pd1 expression and the t rex cells also so here we use that is by the immune checkpoints have a role so with immune checkpoints like inhibitor like pd1 inhibitor or pdl1 inhibitor we can block this pathway and in turn leads to the, there is a synergistic effect between the sbrt and immune checkpoint blockers. Uh, in this propensity uh, score matching analysis, the phase was compared with radiation therapy with immune checkpoint inhibitors. In this pre, uh, study, uh, nivolumab was used as an ICI and what they have found that at uh, the disease control rate at six months was 81% versus 38% and with these two Kaplan near curves, it has been found that the overall survival and the progression free survival was far better in the combination arm of SBRT with ICI as of their today alone. So this is another patient uh, whom we have treated and he has received the immunotherapy as well. This is a large tumor with the inferior vena cava tumor thrombosis, uh, supradiagmatic. So he has received radiation therapy to the entire tumor and the inferior vena cava tumor thrombosis as well. And then he was capped on uh, immunotherapy with atezolizumab and bevacizumab. So this is a scan which is done at 18 months, suggestive of complete response at the primary site, as well as recanalization of the inferior vena cava. Now, SBRT for oligometastatic disease. So as per the, uh, as per the consensus, there's no consensus for the definition but it's an umbrella term which is used for oligo-recurrent disease or oligo-persistent and oligo-progressive disease. Usually, we consider less than five lesions. The point is, if we can treat the lesions with a curative intent, it is oligo-metastatic disease, but if we cannot treat, then it is a metastatic advanced disease. Here are the few studies which have been published where oligo in oligo-metastatic disease uh, the lung metastasis, all lymph node mets and bone uh, mets have been treated along with the liver lesion in two of the studies. And they, in all the studies, they have showed when uh, systemic therapy is combined with local therapy, there's an increase in the overall survival, progression of free survival, as well as the quality of life. Because these are the metastatic patients, with, like in bone metastasis, they must be having some pain. So, uh, with radiation therapy, one can improve the quality of life as well. Uh, again, a uh, few cases that we have treated large tumor in the segment five and six with lymph node metastasis at the presentation, treated with radiation therapy to both the sites simultaneously, and then followed with uh, nivolumab. So, this is a scan done at post two years and is suggestive of complete response at the primary site and the metastatic site as well. Another large HCC of the left lobe of the liver along with segment H with uh, uh, lung nodules at the presentation. So we have treated the liver disease along with the lung disease simultaneously in one go. And the scan done at six months is suggestive of complete response at both the primary and the metastatic site. Another patient with large HCC and bony metastasis, lumbar vertebra, sternal vertebra, and the spinal vertebra process of the thoracic region was treated simultaneously for the bony metastasis, liver lesion, and the bony metastasis in the sternum and the spine uh, transverse process. During the one year follow up, there was complete response at the primary site. The metastatic sites which were treated by SBRT, but yes, patient has developed more metastasis at the other sites and was taken for re-radiation to other different sites. So uncommon scenario, ruptured HCC. So with ruptured HCC, we generally tend to say that there's no, uh, there's no life after uh, such in such patients. So in this patient, the taste was, uh, we have treated the patient with taste single session. There was decrease in the size of the tumor, 
further radiation therapy was given and the patient was doing well even after six months post radiation therapy with decreasing the enhancing component and the size of the rat. For HCC, recurrent HCC post LDLT uh, has undergone multiple lines of TKI. The disease is progressive, uh, undergone multiple uh, taste and microwave procedures for the liver recurrence as well. So we have given radiation therapy to the portal node, multiple liver lesions and the subcarinal nodes simultaneously in one go. So these are the color washes. The dose was given up to a dose of 30 gray in five fractions. And these are the follow-up scans, the suggestive of no arterial enhancing lesion in the subsequent scans. So is there any role of re-radiation as well? We have treated the patient, whether we can retreat the patient. So yes, we can retreat and there are, it is a feasible option without excessive liver toxicity in this paper as well. But it depends on the size of the tumor, the doses which was prescribed earlier and the time interval in between the two. So emerging techniques are proton therapy and MRI-based SPRT. Proton therapy is based on the Bragg's peaks, means the dose deposited in the medium increases with the distance traveled. So maximum dose is deposited at the end of the uh, end of the path. So that is why it is based on this uh, phenomena. And uh, here are the color washes for uh, BMAT, that is proton therapy versus the proton therapy. In proton therapy, due to the Bragg's peak, there is minimum spillage and lesser toxicity to the liver. Whereas in VMAT, there is more spillage and increased chances of toxicity. In this trial where proton was compared with proton, uh, so it can be seen that even uh, with a proton therapy, they can give a higher doses up to a BD of 110 gray with less chances of RILD, that is radiation-induced liver disease, and better overall survival. MRI-guided SBRT is another new emerging technique. It helps in real-time visualization of the anatomy during the radiation therapy, online adaptive radiation therapy, re-radiation with lesser adverse So way forward, this is a pilot study which is done from our institution. Uh, here we have taken the patient sample at before radiation therapy and at the end of radiation therapy. What we have found that there is increase in the PD1 expression in the patients who are viral related, related HCC as compared to the NASH related HCC. So, although it's a pilot study, but we can say uh, that because of the increase in PD1 expression, so these patients should be uh, uh, preferred for immunotherapy as well. and we might respond to immunotherapy in future. Another, uh, it's an unpublished data from ILBS, it's a pilot study where cell-free DNA as a real-time uh, in monitoring has been uh, used as a uh, to predict the clinical response post SBRT in HCC patient. So in this patient, uh, we have taken the sample pre-SBRT and post-SBRT. So in all the patients, the cell-free DNA has reduced post radiation therapy except in one. So when we have seen uh, the data retrospectively, we found that in this patient, there was early local recurrence as well. So we can find with the cell-free DNA, we can find the cell uh, tumor DNA as well, and further telomerase and exogenous mutation analysis can be done. So it's an unpublished work and we'll be doing more work on regarding it. So to conclude, SBRT is a safe and feasible option for advanced HCC and there should, therefore should be considered as a multidisciplinary passion for the patient presenting with advanced HCC. It not only improves the quality of life, but also results in good local control and overall survival with acceptable toxicity. Thank you. So the SBRT is a ray of hope for all the advanced HCC patients. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Uh, <clears throat> uh, about talk, the radiation therapy in HCC management with or without tumor, tumor PVT. And uh, uh, thank you. Nice presentation and 
an interesting case. And uh, uh, I have one question. How the turn uh, SBRT and uh, immune check broker? Um, uh, SBRT first, uh, next I uh, immune check broker, or uh, immune check broker first and next SBRT, which is better? The SBRT followed by immune checkpoint inhibitor is a better option because with SBRT, we can convert the cold tumors into hot tumors. And uh, with SBRT, early local control is there. So early local control in turn lead to uh, translate into increase in overall survival and better responses. Okay. And uh, another question. Uh, you showed the better response uh, uh, of oligometastatic uh, uh, tumor. Um, and uh, <clears throat> um, uh, technical, technical uh, point. Uh, uh, before you uh, perform the SBRT, did you mark uh, the tumor or not? Uh, for example, lipiodor or something? Repiodor marking, did you before performing SVRT? Please pardon. Uh, uh, before you perform SV, yeah. SVRT, did you mark uh, the main tumor? Uh, by uh, lipiodor injection into the tumor no, or not? No, no sir. We, in, in many of the patients, uh, radiation therapy is given post uh, taste, means those patients who are not eligible for uh, taste uh, at the presentation, uh, or they have recurred after taste and not eligible for further local regional therapy, we have considered those patients with SBRT. And because we have 4D C, uh, CT scan in our department with symmetry, so uh, in the CBCT, we can easily visualize the tumor on board imaging. So that is why lipidol is not required. Okay. Mm. Professor uh, Kanda, may I speak? <laughs> nice to yeah. meet you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, excellent, uh, excellent talk, to Professor Sharma. Uh, you pointed out that uh, especially the combination therapy of SBRT and uh, chemo embolization, also sort of inhib and checkpoint uh, inhibitors. Uh, the results uh, better than uh, a long uh, treatment. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, of course, the another uh, local regional therapy, uh, transarterial, uh, Radi ra radio embolization. Uh, it seems that not so logical, but is there any study a combination therapy of uh, TAR and SBRT? Yes, sir. So uh, radiation therapy, uh, TAR has been used in uh, along with SBRT, but in that, in that uh, combination, Tear is being used for the primary tumor of the liver, whereas SBRT was used mainly for the portal vein tumor thrombosis. The second uh, small question. Uh, how about the uh, dose of the uh, radiation? This is the fixed dose or it depends on the tumor size or uh, some other uh, laboratory test? So it depends on the... Uh, the remaining liver volume and the tumor itself. So the smaller tumors can be treated up to a dose of 50, 50 grain, three fractions. If the tumor is very large, as in our cases, or there is involvement of the PVTT, sometimes we have to reduce the dose so as to prevent the doses to the remaining liver. So our priority is the remaining liver as well. We have to maintain a dose of less than 15 grain to the remaining liver. So that is why in one in many of my cases, I have shown a red hot spot in the tumor, 
whereas the periphery is being covered with a blue color wash. That means the bulk of the tumor is receiving more dose to a dose of 35 to 37 or 40 grain pi fraction, as well, whereas the portal vein or the periphery of the tumor is receiving less dose so uh, to reduce the radiation-induced liver injury. Thank you very much. Uh, I congratulate uh, ILBS is becoming a very, very wonderful uh, hepatology center in the world. Thank you, Professor Dogmeji. Uh, is there any question from audience? Uh, one question uh, from audience. How does SBRT to the liver influence distant metastasis or lymph node metastasis? Mm. So when there is, uh, is liver disease along with the lymph node metastasis is better to treat both the lesion in one go and one can easily treat. So uh, what we have seen in our uh, cases that when the metastatic site as well as the primary site has been treated simultaneously, the patient is a better overall survivor. And local uh, may, may I ask a question? Uh, yes. Dr. Bas. Yes, uh, Dr. Dokniti asked about uh, tear, trans tear radioembolization. And uh, in Pakistan, we perform tear for those patients who have the portal vein thrombosis, tumor thrombosis. So, uh, are there any studies from your center or from elsewhere which approach in patients who have the portal vein thrombosis, tumor thrombosis? would be better, whether this would be SBRT or TAIR? So there is no head-on head -on comparison between the TAIR and SBRT. And uh, in the trial, which in the study which is in published from Medanta Group, New Delhi, they have showed the combination of two is a better uh, survival and uh, as such, there is no trial. So we prefer PVTT, for treating the PVTT, SBRT is a better option. But if there is large tumor, then that can be taken care of by tear or SBRT alone, or the combination of TAIS or SBRT. Means tear procedure is also not available in all the centers, so we have to uh, customize our treatment according to the availability process availability in the center. Thank you, Professor Dogmeji. Uh, Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Nice Thank talk. You. We will move to next talk. Mm. Uh, is there a um, professor Laroya? Laroya? Is there? That's right, sir. Thank you. Yes, I'm okay. here. Okay. Mm. Uh, I introduce Professor. Uh, uh, Sharini Laroria. Mm. She graduated from Calicut Medical College with a distinction and completed her post-graduation from the uh, prestigious Dewan Changed Agawar Image and Research Center, New Delhi. She was awarded the National Gold Medal for standing first in the All India National Board examination in radiologists. She did her senior residency training from Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research, Candiga uh, and GB Patent, Patent Hospital, affiliated to uh, Maura. Azad Medical College, New Delhi. Due to her keen interest in abdominal and hepatobiliary imaging, she joined as faculty at ILBS and has done specialized work in transplant and hepatobiliary imaging in the past seven years. She was a core person involved in establishing 
the Department of Radio Diagnosis at ILBS with ins installation of dual energy um, 46 Sly CT scanner, three Tesla MRI and ultrasound machines with contrast ultrasound facility, uh, portable ultrasound, digital X ray and angiography suits. She has uh, initiated and is involved in ongoing research work in the field of MR elastography, multi spectral CT and contrast sonography in the Department of Radio DD at ILBS. She is an accomplished orator and has um, presented various papers at national and international podiums. She has excellent publication is the, in the field of abdominal imaging, uh, where her core interest lies. She has more than 30 um, proffered paper and scientific exhibit to her credit. Uh, today's her talk. Thank you, sir. Thank you. That's a very nice and long introduction. I hope. Uh, but uh, right. I'm just thankful to be here. I'm really grateful to your entire Apostle team and uh, Dr. Sareen and uh, your entire panel for having me here. I think I'll just move on with the work that we do on an everyday basis. And uh, the session was actually meant to be a little interactive. So if our panelists are interested, uh, I'll be happy to see their responses on the chat box. And uh, if not, uh, then of course, I'll be sharing the cases and their solutions. So we are going to discuss today, uh, not the classical, but the atypical manifestations of HCC on imaging. And I will be including uh, CT, MRI, and ultrasound in my discussion of cases. So we all know that the classical uh, LIRAD uh, talks about non-rim arterial phase enhancement, non-peripheral washout, and an enhancing capsule to define what is an HCT. For example, this is the same patient with CT and an MRI. This is an arterial portal venous phase and a hepatic venous phase CT. Here we have AFE or the arterial phase enhancement followed by central washout and a small capsule forming at the end of the hepatic venous phase. On the MR, this is seen better because of the inherent uh, soft tissue resolution of the modality. Look at the enhancement here, central washout, and here is a beautiful capsule around this lesion. And this is a one hour delayed hepatobiliary phase since we use uh, gadolinium Bosta, which is available in India. We really don't have Primo West or EO West which the South Asian countries like Japan and Korea have. We don't have that in India yet, but what we have is a uh, gadolinium boxer, and that gives us a one hour delayed phase, a beautiful washout of the lesion. Now, what I have described here forms the main criteria of a LIRAD lesion. Now, what, what we're gonna talk about today is, if the lesion doesn't show these characteristics, for example, it doesn't show uh, all of these, but has internal growth, Let's Excuse not get me. here, but let's talk. Uh, now I'm uh, sharing your slide from our secretariat. So would you please uh, instruct us? Next slide or something. Now it's a starting at the starting slide now. So slide uh, did not uh, moving. Did this not is the move. first slide. Yes, yeah, yeah. still first slide. Yes. Yeah. So, Are you okay with this? Should I carry yes, on? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right. So then the next. Yes. Uh, how come I'm not able to change this? Okay. Yes, yes. All right. All right. So uh, let's look at this. Uh, let's look at this scan. Now we have a lesion here. It doesn't show the classical enhancement that you had in the previous slide. There is indeterminate washout, and there is some sort of a hypodense nodule on the cirrhotic liver in this patient. Now, would we call this a classical HCC? We will not be able to because of the LIRAD criteria that it doesn't show clear-cut assay, it doesn't have a capsule, and it shows um, some sort of an indeterminate washout. What happens is that, that in nodules less than two centimeters, 
usually the classical appearance of arterial enhancement only happens in 66% cases. And also in pathologically well differentiated SPCs, APA is only seen in almost half of the cases, which means we can miss 50 to 40% of cases if they do not show classical arterial phase enhancement. For example, in moderately or poorly differentiated HCCs, by the time the HCC is, you know, poorly differentiated and has a bad prognosis, we do get the classical features. But the, the group that we want to look at is this, where we want to pick up these smaller lesions so that we can treat them adequately and send them for intervention or for surgery. Now, this is like in biopsy with a small, well differentiated hepatocarcinoma, hepatocellular carcinoma. Now let's move on to our first case. This is a 50-year-old male with a chronic hep B on follow-up, and he comes to us with the CT finding here. Would anybody want to put up their uh, responses to what they think this would be? I think uh, the slides, are the slides moving now? I think the slides are moving now. Yes, yes. Yes, so okay. So anybody has any responses? Can you put in the chat box here? It'll be nice for me to see your responses. Okay, anyway, now, uh, so till we get responses, I'm going to move on. So this is just a little bit of diffuse arterial enhancement. And here we don't really see any lesion. There is no washout. And I really don't see any lesion with a capsular enhancement or any sort of a washout area or abnormal area here. What I actually see is the red herring is a soft tissue lesion in the area of the portal vein, which is nothing but a thrombus in the portal vein. Now, these kind of lesions are nothing but, you know, we followed up these patients on CUS, which is contrast enhanced ultrasound. But these kind of lesions are nothing but serotomimetic lesions where you actually, where you see them like a focal confluent fibrosis, but they're not really focal confluent fibrosis. They are serotomimetic SCCs or infiltrative SCC patterns. And this is what we had in this patient as well. There was this layer area which is arterial enhancing. I'm going to show you the contrast ultrasound images for this patient. Look at the echogenic area on ultrasound. It's the same corresponding area on CT. We give contrast to this patient on ultrasound, and there is a light pulse enhancement of the lesion. That's the area on the B mode study. And here is the entire capsule and everything enhancing in the lesion. And here is a central washout on a little delayed phase of this contrast ultrasound. So this lesion, we labeled it as an infiltrative SCC, and it was later biopsied and found to be a serotomimetic or an infiltrative kind of an SCC. So there are two entities. There is an infiltrative pattern, and there is a serotomimetic pattern. They both look a little different. I'm going to show you both. This is an infiltrative SCC where we did see arterial enhancement. In a serotomimetic SCC, we will not even see this sort of an enhancement in the parenchyma of the liver. So the hey, ASC for this me, is... Excuse me. Slide is OK. Now, case 50-year male with chronic hep B on follow-up slide. No. no, I'm on the contrast study uh, slide, but I'm moving the slide here. Are they not uh, showing you there? You just see the uh, slide uh, shown from the Zoom system. So maybe you are saying. Stop sharing? Um, it says it's sharing live. We are sharing your slide from our side. So would you please see? So when the... I'm moving the slide, are you on the infiltrative SCP slide? Uh, we are moving on behalf of you. So, would you please start? Okay, that? I go back. Yes. Does it, is this the one that is on? Happy, 50 year old mole with, male with chronic happy. Is that the one that is on? Um, No. Uh, it's uh, We're showing that the case, uh, 50 years, something like that. But I am yeah. moving the slide here. Okay. So, uh, I think you should stop sharing and let me share my slide from here. I think you shared the slide from your end. Are you... Please stop that. I will share the slide from my side. Okay. So we we'll stop it. Yes. Please. Yes. I'm going to share my slides now. Oh, yeah, please. Thank you. Can you see a slide which says infiltrative SCP? Yes, but it's please wide, make it wider, like slide shows. Yes, yes, but it's showing, right? It's showing, yeah. the slide is showing, right? Yes. Yeah. And 
Could you uh, put a, a slide show? Uh, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Now you can see? Yeah. Perfect. So it says 50 year old male with head B, right? Yes, yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. I'm going to move it to the next slide. Thank you so much. Can you see the something at the bottom? And this is the next slide. Is that visible now? The ultrasound? Uh, yes, sir, we can see. Yes, yes. Okay. thank you. I think that's fine now. Yes. Thank you for stopping me right there. Okay, so okay. this is the contrast enhanced ultrasound for this patient. And here is an echogenic area. We give contrast here, there is enhancement. This is the corresponding B mode image. And here is the enhancement on the arterial phase, followed by the so called portal venous phase and the delayed phase, where there is a lot of central washout. So this patient was uh, infiltrative HCC, was later found to have an AFP of 5,500 units. Uh, should I keep going? Can you hear me? Okay, and this is the diffuse heterogeneous lesion. So I was saying something about a serotomimetic HCC, and this is what a serotomimetic HCC would look like. Another patient with a 57-year-old male patient, cirrhosis like HCC. We really don't see any mass lesion here. When we give contrast, there is no arterial enhancement. All we see is a thread and streak appearance of the portal vein, which has tumor thrombus in it, and it is showing enhancement on arterial phase. This is just a cystic area of the liver superior to this lesion. It has no uh, really uh, you know, value with this tumor. All it's showing is a large cystic area, but according to that of the section, and there is no mass lesion here. On the portal venous phase and the delayed phase, I really don't see a mass lesion here. The clue to in such cases is only an arterial phase enhancing thrombus in the portal vein, which on the portal uh, in the portal vein, which on the later phases shows up as a thrombus in the portal venous and hepatic venous phase. No defined mass. So this has to be not missed by the radiologist because this is a cirrhosis-like HCC, which means it has infiltrated into the uh, liver parenchyma, but it is not showing up as a mass. Such lesions only present as a diffusely nodular liver, not a dominant mass, and they have better histological differentiation, low proliferative tumor activity, and a lack of metastasis, which means they have a better prognosis than the other lesions. Let's look at this lesion. Look at this mass here. There is an exophytic component of the mass lesion. There is arterial phase enhancement. And then there is washout in this area. But what I'm truly trying to show you in this lesion is the pattern of this lesion here, which is a mosaic pattern. This mosaic pattern is known as mosaic because of the infiltrating fat within such mass lesions. Here is a larger area of fat involvement. And this is the capsule with the washout of the main part of the tumor with a central part of fat within it. Now, this is a very, very important component that one has to be very aware of. Microvesicular steatosis is much more common than seeing this large areas of fat. 20% of HCCs are bound to have fat within them, and they can range from in the range of 1 to 1.5 centimeter. The incidence of smaller tumors is about 35%. And this has been labeled as an ancillary finding in the LIRAD table. Look at this lesion. Like I just said, 1 to 1.5 centimeters. This lesion is about 2.5 centimeters. There is no obvious arterial enhancement in this lesion. Look at the portal venous phase. There is no capsule, no washout. There is no apparent area of a tumor like lesion. Why? Because it is being masked by the fat within the tumor. So this patient had NASH. So this patient had fat within the liver itself. So if a patient has NASH, and we know that the patient is a known case of NASH, we have to be always very careful of such lesions which do not give a typical arterial enhancement and may appear to be non-enhancing. That's because of the fat within it, which does not allow the arterial enhancement to be overt or obvious when we are seeing the scan. Such lesions have to be looked at by MR itself and have to be dealt with very suspiciously and would usually warrant a biopsy. We did give it a LIRAD3, but we said this is more likely to be an SCC. On ultrasound, such lesions will also mimic hemangiomas or fat like lipomas, and they will be echogenic with a V, a fatty, uh, with a V and HCC, which may appear heterogeneous on 
have just found otherwise. Fatty SPCs have less well-developed internal angioarchitecture and pathological series, and that is the reason why the vascularity is not very well seen in such lesions. Moving on to an MR, MR shows a large lesion here. This is an in and a post phase, this is chemical shift imaging, and an area inside this, if you note this, this is not a nodule in nodule appearance. What we see here is actually a fatty area within this mass lesion. This area is hyperintense. This is also ISO2 hyperintense, but this area is hypo on fat suppression image. That means only this part is fatty and the rest of the lesion is the soft tissue mass. When we give contrast, this part of the area enhances, which is arterial enhancement. This area doesn't, and it remains like an area of washout, or it may appear like a small area of necrosis, but it truly isn't necrosis. It is just a fatty area within it, and this is the area of washout, followed by this large tumor here with a faint capsule forming around it. This also is a fatty SCC, and here I've marked the areas for you. Now we've seen such similar lesions. What do you think would this lesion be? Any takers for the diagnosis? Do I have something on the chat? Okay. I'm not getting anything on the chat. Mm. I'm not getting anything on the chat. Anybody would like to share and say what they're seeing on the chat? All right. So since I'm not getting any responses, so now this lesion looked like a, uh, you know, like look like exactly like the previous one that we saw. Here is the one, but actually, this lesion is another lesion. This showed multiple smaller lesion and a larger lesion here. We had to biopsy this lesion to rule out. The only giveaway key was that this liver was a non, it was not non cirrhotic. There was no history of cirrhosis. There was no history of FP or any other liver disease. And hence, these large lesions with arterial enhancement, a similar capsule like appearance and washout was nothing. We gave it out as a hypervascular metastasis or multifocal HCP, but it was actually a neuroendocrine mess. So the, the biopsy showed that this was suggestive of a metastatic neuroendocrine tumor, which is a surprise for us. But truly, no surprise because neuroendocrine tumors also behave as hypervascular lesions in the liver. Moving on to the next case. Okay, so this is something that the previous speaker has already talked about. And this is a liver um, which is cirrhotic. But what is the soft tissue here? The soft tissue here is subdiaphragmatic. It's above the liver and below the diaphragm, and we see a lot of soft tissue. But what we need to note is that it is enhancing on the arterial phase. So there is some enhancement of the soft tissue part here. It is not just hemorrhage that we would think it could be or a ruptured abscess. And here we see hemoperitoneum because this was blood within the subdiaphragmatic area or the perihepatic space. And look at this, we've already described it. What exactly could this be? Because it has the enucleation sign, and enucleation means that apart from a large tumor, there appears to be tumor tissue coming out of it, which is the enucleation sign, and it is enclosed by the tumor. Hence, this was a ruptured HCC into the sub uh, subdiaphragmatic and the perihepatic space. But what gives away is the arterial enhancement, supply of vascularity from the arterial structures, and this is the area of washout with hemoperitoneum within it. So large tumor size, like we've already seen in the previous talk, large tumor size, increased intertumoral neurovascularity, contour protrusion, portal vein thrombosis, trauma, and rarely phase could also lead to tumor rupture, which is usually seen in up to 1.5% of cases. Now this lesion, we labeled it as a visceral lava migrant because it appeared totally non-arterial enhancing, had the classical appearance of conglomerated lesions clustered together, and also giving some sort of enhancement with small areas of liquefaction within it. They also seem to be central in the segment 5, and this is what we thought was a visceral lava migrant. But it actually turned out to be, to our surprise, an HCC, which is not really enhancing. We called it an inflammatory pseudo-tumor. Any guesses on what this lesion could be? I'm not getting anything on the chat. So when I don't get anything on the chat, I believe that there is, uh, that it is, nobody has anything to say. So here, so this is a lesion with um, hypodensity, 
I hope the slides are projecting, right? Uh, is there on the is there someone on the meeting? Hello. Yes, am I connected? Uh, yeah, your connected slides are uh, moving. Go ahead, okay. please. Fine, fine. I thought there is uh, no response from any of the chat, so fine. I'm just increasing the size. Okay. So uh, this was the uh, um, this was any guesses on what this could be? So this is a very rare tumor. Here we had a large cystic area with areas of enhancement within the lesion, and this is a soft tissue component within the lesion, and multiple arterial enhancing lesions started in the liver. Like we saw this appears in the last talk, we just saw that this appears to be, uh, you know, a post taste or a post tear lesion with areas of liquefaction. But this was a de novo HCC, and this was actually a cystic degeneration of a large HCC lesion, and the other lesions were all arterially enhancing. They show washout in the later phases with capsule formation. This is a completely untreated HCC with central liquefaction and necrosis. So such lesions should not be mistaken or you know misidentified for post-treated lesions or for cystic metastasis from other such adenocarcinomas or uh, aggressive malignant tumors. Usually biliary cyst adenomas, metastases, and phalangeocarcinomas can appear with the same appearance and like I said, should not be mistaken always for this. So the only end goal is biopsy. This is a very interesting case. This is a CT and an MR of the same patient just for elucidation. Here is the CT, a plain scan. If you're wondering what this is, this is a stent, a CBD stent within the bile duct. Here is the arterial enhancement of a large lesion. What is to be noted is that the lesion is encasing the bile duct here. Look at the encasing soft tissue here and how it is progressed. This is the capsule and the washout within the lesion, arterial enhancement later, and here is the large washout tumor. On the MR, this is a plain scan. This is a diffusion where the mass lesion is apparently seen. Look at the beautiful comet tail like appearance where the tumor is extending within the bile duct, and here is the bile duct encasing it. This is the enhancement of the lesion, and this is a coronal reconstruction where you can see the capsule and the lesion is invaded. This part of the duct is missing, this black part is the duct. And this part of the duct is missing, the tumors involved the entire duct as well as the right portal vein. So, this is the SCC which is invading an extra hepatic extension into the bile duct along with uh, uh, being the cause of obstructive jaundice. Now, this again is a very, very rare presentation of SCC and it's usually seen in uh, Asian population more than the Western population as I searched the literature. Here is the cut section of the resected liver from this patient when it underwent a uh, extended right hepatectomy, and this is the uh, tumor invading the bile duct here and the rounded encasement of the uh, mass lesion. Let's look at another MR of another atypical SCC. Why I've rounded off this area? That you can see, see the speck of a bright spot out here and another dark spot out here. So, this is an in and out phase or a chemical shift imaging. If we see a bright phase on a T1 weighted in phase, that means there is hemorrhage or mineral deposition. This is likely to be hemorrhage if this is a mass lesion. And here is the fat suppression sequence, so which means that there is a suppression on a fat suppression sequence, means this is intratumoral fat. So there is intratumoral fat, and also on the contrast study, we see areas of biliary dilatation. So these are peripheral bile ducts. This is a solitary HCC lesion which seems to be extending. Look at the lesion here. This is washed out in the portal venous phase and on the delayed phases. This is extended into the porta. And if you look at the coronal reconstruction, you can see how a solitary tumor here has now invaded the bile duct. How this is different from the previous tumor is that this is the de novo solitary lesion inside the liver and has then infiltrated into the peripheral bile duct. Whereas that lesion that we saw on the previous slide was a evolving around the bile duct. So there is a little difference in the two, but the manifestation is the same. It will present as biliary uh, obstruction. So this was internal fat as well as hemorrhage into the lesion and extension into the segmental duct. A very, very rare presentation. Another rare presentation here is a patient presenting to us with multiple skeletal deposits and metastases. There is one lytic lesion in the vertebra, here in the ribs, and in the large 
mass lesion in the scapula. All are intensely enhancing on the arterial phase. Look at the enhancement here. And this is the key lesion, the primary lesion in the liver and a large adrenal deposit as well. So it is rare for an HCT to be presenting as uh, lytic metastasis of the skeleton, which shows similar enhancement, hypervascular pattern, and the adrenal lesion as well. Like here, I'm showing you skeletal and adrenal mess are less percentages of in, uh, involvement by HCT. In such the, uh, lesions, we can use the spectral CT beautifully. Now that itself is in itself is a large topic, but what I'm going to deal with in spectral CT is a spectral CT only gives you differentiation of material composition, whether iodine has moved into a lesion or not, and it can quantify the iodine within it. When we quantify the iodine, we can say for sure that there is enhancement within this lesion or not. When we see likely or you know not very intensely enhancing lesions, all we need to do is quantify the iodine within them and compare it to the parenchyma around it. So what I've seen here, the red dot is within the mass, which is SCP, and here is the blue dot, which is the liver. When I look at lower KAVs, it's difficult to make out the difference between the two. As I increase my KAV, which is the kilo electron volts, to about 75 to 80 as a window, I can start to see the difference between the two lesions, and hence spectral CT helps me in distinguishing these two lesions. Uh, uh, by using spectro CT images and my graph. It also helps me quantify the iodine on these iodine density images where I see the lesions better than what I would see here as a delineated mark. So if I'm unsure of something like this, I would move on to a spectral CT. Looking at another atypical presentation, venous involvement, we can see the IVC here loaded with a tumor thrombus. That's the IVC in the axial section. This is the culprit lesion. And here is a large mass in the upper part of the segment 8 as well as segment 5. It has adrenal mess as well on both sides and multiple lung deposits all coming from the same lesion. This lesion has distinctly metastasized into various components uh, and has vast extension and infiltration. This, uh, all these manifestations are a little rare. And CT would be the ideal modality for such a situation because you want to see this in your practice. Now, uh, a, very, uh, a, a very intriguing case, a 57-year-old lady, she just complained of heaviness and pain. She had no previous liver disease, came to us for an MRI and a study, and this was literally uh, an incidental finding. I see here a large mass lesion in the left upper quadrant, and it is compressing the stomach. We have given some oral contrast to see, and the stomach was compressed. Uh, all I see here is a large mass lesion in the left upper quadrant, and here are the other T2 weighted images to delineate the lesion better. And there is this large lesion taking over the entire left upper and mid abdomen and seems to have an infiltrating plane with the left lobe of the liver from which it is literally hanging out like a huge fruit from a tree. So this is a large mass lesion. We had it biopsied right away and we gave a differential of a mesenchymal or a gastrointestinal tumor or a subdiaphragmatic leomyoma because this looked like a large mesenchymal tumor and uh, our biopsy was really surprising. This was found to be a fibrolaminar HCC arising from the left lobe of the liver, completely exopatic in its component with the large central scar. So very, very atypical presentation of that. This was a 51-year-old male. We diagnosed him as an SCC on imaging because he had a classical large right lobe involvement and lots of arterial enhancement. That's the tumoral you know, representation so that when you do a taste, we know exactly which arteries are supplying the tumor. So I would always advise to get a nice CCT angio done so that we can see how the tumor distribution from the vessels is. And here is a large central necrotic scar. It's not a characteristic scar. It's probably a scar because the tumor has outgrown its supply. And here we have a large area of necrosis playing the right anterior portal vein and the left, uh, the right posterior portal vein. And here it's even lifting up the diaphragm on the right side. And this is how we depict this entire tumor. On biopsy, this is found to be uh, on the uh, gross pathology, it was resected. And here it was found to be a large fibrolamular carcinoma. So word on the fibrolamular carcinoma, it has been perceived as a variant of conventional HCC. It's a very small proportion, hardly 15% of all HCC, seem to arise in a distinct group, either younger, 20 to 35, no gender predilection, but both our cases were of 51 to 52-year-old male and female both. 
there is literally no association with previous uh, liver disease or any geographical distribution. These are usually solitary, as is was in both our cases. And AFC, which is usually a giveaway in other HPCs, is normally in the normal range. Management also is unique to this tumor. It is aggressive surgical management and transplant is one of the rare indications where it is indicated in such large tumors in cases like this. Moving on to another case, a 65-year-old gentleman, cirrhotic for three years of HPV, AFP, CEA, CA19, every tumor marker is normal, comes to us for a CT scan to look at what is happening. And here is a tumor where we see a large cranial component, which has mild enhancement on the outside, a caudal component as we come down, which was minimal arterial enhancement, no significant enhancement, but here there is some arterial enhancement. The caudal portion has no arterial enhancement. The cranial portion has bile duct thickening and bile duct involvement with dilatation. Here is the caudal portion where there is only minimal involvement. Caudal portion shows portal vein thrombosis, and here is the delayed phase where we see the thrombus better. Now, what is happening? We're getting mixed signals from this lesion. It is neither behaving like completely like an HPC nor like a phalangiocarcinoma because it has arterial enhancement not seen in phalangiocarcinomas and it has progressive enhancement without washout not seen in HPC. So, obviously, the, if there is a mixed signal, it has to be a mixed tumor, which is what it was. It was a combined hepatocellular carcinoma and intraductal phalangiocarcinoma. It was biopsied, and this is a coronal section of the same. Look at the biliary involvement, it has biliary dilatation as well as arterial enhancement. Multiple nodes are seen, usually seen more in cholangiocarcinoma, progressive enhancement later with infiltration of the bile duct and a large biliary uh, ductal dilatation as well. Itself, patient had a left hepatectomy and followed by chemotherapy after his diagnosis. And two years later, the patient had multiple deposits in the lung. This is the biopsy specimen from the same patient. Now, sometimes, Benign looking lesions like these come to us in the emergency room. This patient has come from outside referred to ILBS as a liver abscess with a pigtail catheter inside the lesion. Here we have arterial enhancement. Why I'm showing you this case is obviously because it's not a liver abscess and it's in our HCC series. And the red herring here is that there is no real enhancement outside of this lesion in the parenchyma. There is a lot of arterial enhancement. These appear like soft tissue septations and not like just classical rounded, well defined enhancement. Makes me very suspicious. And I ask for a biopsy from the periphery of this lesion. This lesion is also probably ruptured and there is pleural effusion in this patient. And lo and behold, it is found to be an SCC on uh, biopsy. And it's, it's just a necrotic SCC which is mimicking a liver abscess. Another patient here, these are the CT images, four of them, and these are the similar MR images of the same. When we see a large solitary lesion, characteristic enhancement, plain arterial phase enhancement with capsule formation, and here is a large area of washout. Similar thing on MR, this is the plain T1, T2, a diffusion distinct, uh, you know, it is intensely restricted, and here we have enhancement with washout in the capsule. Not all such lesions and all that glitters is not gold always. So we asked for an HCC. Uh, the, the core biopsy done outside was suggestive of HCC, but there was no extra hepatic disease. And we all also thought that this is an HCC. This is a very teaching case. This patient underwent a resection. This is a tumor resected from the liver. And here are the slides. The pathological specimen showed that there were some neuro neuroendocrine components to this. After that, we asked him for a daughter of PET scan, and here is the main carcinoid or the main tumor, and these were the metastases, which means that, that large metastases was the tumor in the liver, and this is the residual left liver seen on the daughter of PET scan. So this taught us a very important lesson. Whenever we are evaluating HCTs or solitary lesions in the liver, especially in a non serotic lesion such as this one, one must always look at the entire abdomen and the chest as well to look for primaries with solitary metastasis. And this is what that lesion was. Another case, 65 old gentleman with all tumor markers normal on HPV follow-up. And here we see this large lesion here in the caudate lobe. Looks like an enhancing tumor. There is a beautiful washout and it appears to have a capsule as well. Multiple nodes in the lung. I thought these are metastatic nodes. And here there are multiple nodes in the abdomen as well. What do we see in the coronal reconstruction? The tumor seems to have infiltrated the IVC. Let's move on to the next section. There is a reconstruction that we made for this arterial lesion. 
supply from the iota just like the IVT derives its supply from the iota the same thing the lesion is deriving its arterial supply from the iota there is a cleavage plane between the IVT and the liver and the tumor seems to have a central area within the IVT so what appear to be actually a liver lesion is truly an extra hepatic IVT lesion it's an it's an IVT leomyosarcoma which is just uh, infiltrating or having a cleavage pain with the liver. This was a sorry, it's a spindle cell sarcoma, which is similar variant to a liver sarcoma. And we must always be wary of extra hepatic lesions infiltrating into the liver. I'm really running short on time, so I'm going to run through these cases. Uh, this was again a, a last red herring case. Lesion looks very aggressive. These are just plain T2 images. This is the T1 with areas of hemorrhage. When we do a contrast study, it is so classically like an FTC, lots of arterial enhancement, areas of washout, capsule formation, and we feel, oh, we have an FTC on our hands. But this is a young 21-year-old boy, and he had on biopsy was found to be a phalangiectatic adenoma. So what I'll say is that not all hypervascular lesions have to be thought of FTC, and not all hypervascular lesions should be dismissed as non-FTC. So we must have... Um, always a discriminatory approach and going for a biopsy whenever we need to and make as best the diagnosis on imaging as possible. With that, I would like to thank you for your patience. Thank you, Professor Timer. Hmm. Uh, many interesting cases. Uh, 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 Fibrolamina carcinoma is very interesting. <laughs> yes, it is truly. So yeah. two cases, and then we did see one or two more, but it is a very dicey lesion. Is there any question, uh, Professor Dogmeji? May I talk? Yes, yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent talk, and also very informative and detailed information. Uh, also, your cases are really excellent. Uh, you. As you know, uh, hemangioma in the liver was seen is seen very very common, and uh, radiological appearance of the hemangioma is very very uh, informative. And sometimes in some cases we cannot distinguish uh, that is the hemangioma or hepatocellular carcinoma. Can you give us some specific clues for the differentiation of? this uh, two type of solid nodules? Right. So uh, that is a very good question. Actually, there are many hypervascular lesions with which XCP can be uh, mistaken. Hemangioma is one of them. But our real problem arises when it's not a classical hemangioma. So a classical hemangioma will never be a problem for a good radiologist who's used to looking at hepatobiliary imaging. But a sclerosed hemangioma is a challenge for anyone. If the hemangioma is sclerosed in the middle, it is not going to fill in or opacify completely. And that appearance may look like a washout or an incompletely filled FTC. And in those cases, we will have to go by the LIRAD criteria of growth in the interval phase. So we look at all the main major criteria of LIRAD, which says arterial enhancement, capsule formation, washout, and interval growth. If all these three, all the four criteria are met, then of course we have to call it an FTC. But if all the four criteria are not met, and we, especially in an MR, if you can look at a hemangioma, I mean, usually the garden variety will not be a problem for anybody. Any good radiologist will be able to see it. But a sclerosed hemangioma is definitely an issue. In those cases, I would recommend a contrast enhanced ultrasound or an MR. Even a CT would be fine, but these two modalities are better and more sensitive. So, um, sclerosed hemangiomas are the only challenge. Uh, a regular hemangioma will never be a challenge. Thank you. Uh, Professor Abbas? Yeah, the excellent presentation and good collection of cases. I just want to know, because most of your patients underwent MRI to discriminate what type of Leon is this, so what type of contrast uh, are you using? Because uh, uh, sometimes we get fear uh, with elevated keratinine that patient may have nephrogenic systemic fibrosis with gadolinium. So the, there are other contrasts like gadoxinate or primovist uh, that uh, we are using here sometimes. Uh, 
So I just want to know your experience of uh, you choosing the contrast while giving the MRI. Right. That's a very good question, sir. So like I mentioned in my talk, uh, so there are two things. The contrast available in India is gadolinium bopta, which is uh, not primovit. It is uh, a different contrast. The only difference between primovit and bopta is that uh, bopta excretes the, uh, con the liver uh, contrast into the biliary duct after about 60 minutes, whereas primovit excretes, uh, the, the, the hepatocytes excrete uh, primovit within 20 minutes. So that is a bigger, uh, that's the main issue. And the uptake of BOPTA is about 5 to 6%, whereas of EO waste or PRIMO waste is about 50% as well by the parasite. Now, having said that, uh, both contrasts are equally good if you have a good MR machine. Like we have shown you, on MR, we're usually able to pick up enhancements very well. And if not on MR, you could always use a very good CT. And both CT and MR together should give you the same solution. I would not say that Primovis is better than uh, Bokta. I would only say that it is faster than Bokta. But at the cost of the price of the contrast. So Bokta is literally uh, one fifth the cost of Primovis or EOVIS. And I think uh, looking at the cost factor, I would say that Bokta is equally good. Secondly, you talked about the renal, con uh, the renal issues. Now, nephrogenic systemic fibrosis is a very, very rare entity. In fact, I searched up the literature because we have a lot of patients who have kidney diseases along with the liver problems. I know you get the same amount of patients with kidney disease as well. MR is a very, very safe contrast. Whether you use Primovis, Eovis, Bopta, or any other contrast, they're all very safe contrast. Nephrogenic systemic fibrosis is very, very rare compared to iodinated contrast from the CT. And if you have a well hydrated patient, which we always do. We always ensure that the patient is well hydrated. It should not be a problem to take up any patient for a CT or an MR. So I think uh, that is the main issue. Creatinine is a very, very, uh, uh, it's a very gross marker. It's not a very good marker. It's actually the GFR that has to be looked at. But with MR, we rarely have had any patient. In fact, the entire world literature, there is more worry about it than it's an actual reality. It's really a very, very rare phenomenon. Uh, thanks, Professor Thalini. I think uh, now, so people are listening so long. It is quite the like first two hours in webinar, but there is good attendance also. But still, it is interactive. So I think, uh, Professor Kanda, uh, we hope you have done for the day. So we'll uh, going to close this session. And as we have planned every month, second Tuesday is going to be the alkyl. So we'll meet again in the next month. So thank you our all experts. And uh, thank you, Professor Kanda, to be graceful in such a short notice. I'm highly obliged. And all our APAS legacy members. And I thank you all on behalf of Professor Sarin. And uh, we are going to close this session. Thank you. Professor Kanda, thank you very much. It's great pleasure. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Also, this is have my a good night. Okay. Uh, thank Hi, you, Professor. Professor Sorry, Sorry. How are you? Very nice to see everyone, and thank you, Professor Kanda. Thank you very much, and thank you, Kadir, and uh, everyone, and all the speakers. It's very nice, very grateful. Thank you. Have a good day. Have a good bye day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.